Uh, welcome Hello. to Face the Music. It's, uh, it's an honour to be here and to particularly be involved in the very first uh, session of uh, this year's conference. Um, yeah, I just want to quickly say that uh, you guys have already done the hard work. You've, you've committed, you're here, you've, you've bought a ticket. Um, now now it's you have to really engage with this conference, you know. Um, we're not going to try and sit here and tell you how it's done. We really want you guys to interact with us and, and get some information across to you that is going to be helpful. So uh, obviously I hope you, you get something out of this panel, but then also come up to everyone on the panel um, afterwards, come out and say hi. This is one of these things you get out as much as you put in. So uh, here's to a, a very good uh, FTM. Now, uh, I've got uh, some very illustrious people on this panel with me today, and uh, it's good to start off on a very positive note. My name is uh, Scott Fitzsimons, and I'm the editor of themusic.com.au. I uh, run, manage all the digital properties for Street Press Australia, um, so newsletters and websites and apps and that sort of thing. Uh, and as part of that, I do a lot of the industry reporting, and it's been my privilege and uh, my to great enjoyment over the last couple of years to be reporting on bands like Shepherd and Vance Joy and Gorche and the Griswolds and uh, watching them crack into various markets around the world. Um, and I think everyone here's got a little bit of experience with that. Uh, Marshall Betts from the Windish Agency in America um, looks after a number of big acts, including uh, Courtney Barnett is on their, their roster. Uh, Aisha from Psycho Management, who has a little artist called Lord uh, that she's somewhat involved with. Um, Will from Parallel uh, looks after the presets. Uh, also Nina Las Vegas, I think, is on that, that roster as well and a few other people. And, uh, and Cy Gould from um, our Wonder Call, who uh, looks after Hiatus Coyote and promoting and, and various other things. And we'll be here all day if we go through everything you're involved with. Um, but to start off, I'm going to throw a question right in the middle. And you guys can all fight over it to see who wants to pick it up. But are Australian acts having more success overseas? Is that a true statement? Or are we just hearing more about it now? Uh, being the only one from overseas, I'll answer first. We, we um, got a New Zealander here as well. Yeah, oh yeah, that's true. Sorry. Um, I think that um, I think that we are hearing more about it, but generally because of the success that's happening um, nationally here as well. Um, uh, generally, when you have artists that are having success, like Flume, um, uh, that will translate worldwide anyways, um, because, um, you know, uh, money talks, and um, when you have artists that can come and translate uh, to any um, medium, especially in the U.S., um, people are going to try and be ahead of the curve and ahead of trends. And um, when they see that it's all coming from over here, um, they're going to try and have one step, um, one foot forward on everybody. And um, you know, you might be more interested in Australian music because you see the success of people um, here. So um, I think that it's more of a, a thing that's happening nationally that people are just trying to be ahead of the curve on. So do you, as well as looking at specific artists that are doing well, do you look at the scene as someone from overseas and goes, they've got their shit together, they're doing quite well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, and I think it, you know, it's happening here now, but it also happened in Brooklyn uh, 10 years ago, you know, with bands like MGMT and MGMT and things like that, you know, Seattle, obviously. You know, these, these little pockets and scenes happen everywhere, and now the industry is in, in such an international state that it can kind of happen uh, anywhere. And so when you have these large artists um, becoming extremely successful here, you know, I know Lord isn't a Australian artist, but you know. We'll um, take it. Yeah, you know, when you, people, people will pay attention to that and they will try to champion that. And um, it's, it just so happens that I think in the past couple of years, um, that it's, yeah, that it's happening down here. Will, you've, you've been doing this for a little while now. Have you felt a shift or seen a shift in the last couple of years locally? Yeah, I think there has been a shift. I think that maybe one of the things that's pretty key is um, 10 years ago or so, people always 
looked at Australian music coming into the international market as being Australian music firstly and foremostly. And although there is scenes that are picked up now, I think that there's been a bit of a change in perception and that people are more willing and happy to look at music on its merits. Um, I think probably across a number of different genres as well, um, I think that perhaps the music people are producing from Australia is probably more diverse and of a higher standard than perhaps it was a few years ago. Not to say it was bad, but just particularly as, as genres have opened up and stuff like that, definitely in terms of the fields of dance music and alternative music, obviously. Um, it's a lot stronger. Um, yeah. Why is that? Is there more competition around? Are people keeping each other on their toes? Is there communities building that are they're fueling each other along? I think there's definitely like a community infrastructure that's been built over the past 10 years, mm. um, working, like, because I if, I, if I go back, I worked in New York for Australian bands and then came to New Zealand to push to America and the UK. So I think when we have now these pockets of people who've moved from these territories over there to bring their music into these territories and vice versa, there's just more of a base and infrastructure. If I'm to go to New York or whatever, there's probably, from a New Zealand perspective, there's 10 Kiwi musicians or managers and they're all in their own community and they own a whole street of Brooklyn and that's our infrastructure as we export. I, I mean, I became more aware of the Australian music community by going overseas and knowing and just finding out, finding these uh, radio DJs or promoters who are over there who have, who have looked into the little scene and then seeing it for their eyes, whereas, I mean, they're just, we just see a uh, whole collectives of musicians and friends but we don't take a little snapshot at it and look at it as a scene sometimes you know you don't see it as clicky or anything like that it's just your buddies and people you see around you know when you're in Chicago and someone's telling you about a bedroom producer who lives in Northco who's never played a show before you go wow they're seeing it as a scene and they, then you start you know working from there it's it's interesting because this panel is obviously about the, the overseas market but what I'm getting from all four of you straight away is the importance of having a strong local market to be able to, you know, send that out. Now, I, I reckon there's probably a few self-managed artists and sort of young people trying to break into the industry here. Uh, show of hands quickly for any self-managed artists. Yeah, so that, that's a big proportion. Um, because the, the local scene is, is so important, those communities are so important, at what point should you then start putting a plan together for an international career? Is it really early? I think it comes down to interest, really. I mean. At the end of the day, you can get your music up on SoundCloud or wherever very quickly, and it can be picked up very quickly and very organically. Um, I think in terms of an international plan, I think that if you can find a way to get over there and do things that's easy and cheap, great, but also it's not the be-all and end-all. I think probably rather than travelling first, something that is becoming more important and is happening organically anyway is um, international blogs picking up on Australian music has... A, good feedback both into the international market but also back into the Australian market. I mean, people won't admit it, but definitely for playlists for radio and stuff like that, if they can see that there's international traction on your tracks from the onset, it definitely helps in terms of getting a bigger presence in Australia too. So it's pretty easy to reach out to people. You can actually find most contacts for most of those international blogs fairly easily. And if you're resourceful, it doesn't have to be an expensive process. But I think it's probably better to build a bit of a platform before you go out. And you, you, you're dead right that things move so quickly these days in terms of SoundCloud and blogs can pick you up and it can sort of be feel overnight. If that happens, should you have a plan just in case to say, we, we don't really necessarily want to go overseas, but if this does happen, this is the steps we're going to take? Well, it depends what kind of act you are. I mean, you can be a DJ or a band. You know, it's very different for each case. Obviously, you know, the logistics of getting a band over to the US or something is going to be a lot more restrictive financially, um, as against if you're a solo artist or, or, a, or a DJ. So um, in the background, yes, I mean, there's always, as everyone knows, a lot of grants you can be applying for and all that kind of stuff, which are good to have in the back pocket. But um, I don't know, not quite as easy as that, I would say. So what sort of plans together do you put for, for bands you're working with? Do you wait for the opportunities to come from overseas or do you go try and source them out? Both. Um, with, with for Oscar, for instance, Oscar Kisung, I manage, he 
he definitely had a sound and he has a direction. And when we first started from the end game, he's not, <clears throat> he's not passionate about Australia in the same way where you think an idea of like getting into the London scene or getting into like, you know, deep into the US club scene or touring Europe. They were the goals that we started at. And so when we started working with him, we worked out that he needed to get his live show really happening here, but all, we were already starting to put plan B, C and D in place for Europe and for the US. And half of those plans never happened, but we had them there. And when it did clock on, We've done those tours to Asia now and to Europe and to the US a couple of times. So he's going over there each time, building upon what he's doing. With hiatus, um, we, had, we had no plans, none of that. And we had that moment where something went viral and um, we had to make a plan very quickly. Um, so, uh, and, and since then, every single thing we do with hiatus is thinking about internationally. And uh, it's never one plan for everything. It's, you know, and now we're getting more into each territory, working out what the plan is, what the rollout is for every song, for every release, every bit of artwork, all that stuff that comes into it, we're thinking about globally and how do we not treat everyone the same? How do we treat everyone uniquely and, and give them the respect that they deserve as fans or an audience? Um, Aisha, with Lord, was the international market always the goal? Yeah, I think it always is the goal to kind of take it to the next level. And in and, and the theory of how we reacted to that was strategizing who our team was before we put the music out and who might be interested. So sending it to tastemakers and sending it to people that work with artists that we love um, and seeing if they're interested and they were. And, and so we were being proactive instead of reactive. And then once those things were in place and we put the music out and it naturally kind of popularized, we had that team in place and they were pushing it really hard. And that's what I think led to such an extreme plan. That answers that. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and Marshall, I guess, you know, you know, I think the hiatus example is quite good. You know, you have that little bit of viral interest and you have to act on that. Um, with, with bands coming from Australia at the moment, are we in a, a better position than we were to put those plans together quickly because the market is looking at us going, yeah, they've got their stuff together? Um, I think that you still have to have some sort of financial plan and backing in terms of touring in order to capitalise on that. Um, you know, in Australia and most other countries outside of the U.S., you are lucky that um, you guys get funding from uh, your government. And um, I know that, for example, with Courtney Barnett, um, she was able to come over relatively quickly after, um, after her initial success at CMJ. And, um, you know, I don't know that it was exactly because she had funding, but she had put that into place um, we, so that she was able to do that and strike while the iron was hot. And had she not been able to come back immediately um, after CMJ, things might not have been the same because promoters in the United States and elsewhere wouldn't have seen that she was coming and selling out these small rooms. And she wouldn't have had time to come and do the press state-wise that um, that she did um, and it was probably a really expensive trip but what it led to was interest from Lollapalooza and Coachella and things like that and um, had she just come for CMJ it would have been a flash in the pan but you know her management and everybody had the foresight to see that you know if things had gone the way that they planned then they would be able to take advantage of that so you do need to have some sort of backing in case those things happen, but then there's also cases like Lord, where it just happens so quickly that I don't think there's any way you could have planned for you know, what was gonna happen with her. And you need to readjust those things. So it's a bit of give and take, but you should always, I mean, you're gonna believe in your artists, so you should always be planning two steps ahead. Yeah, yeah. and I think uh, there's probably a few people sitting in the room at the moment going, oh, that, that's all good and well, but where am I gonna get 50 grand to go overseas and put that infrastructure together and then have the money to go back and capitalize on those ideas? There's still a, a bit of a, you know, it's, it's quite a, a challenging thing, quite a daunting thing as well, touring overseas. Um, how do you take that first step you know, was what systems are in place and is, is it as daunting as it seems? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, for me, certainly to start with, it was whenever I started doing international touring 10 years ago or something, I had no 
didn't know where to start. I think it, you've just got to try as best you can break it down. Um, spend as much time as you can budgeting. Um, and if you have friends or colleagues or people you know that can maybe assist you with some templates to work with is a help. Um, and I think always, as best you can, be as realistic as you can with budgets as well. So if they're door deals and all that kind of stuff, probably work on a really realistic scenario as against a best case scenario because the two can be um, quite different. I'd also like definitely point out there's things like in the States you need to be mindful of um, potential pitfalls like uh, you know withholding tax, which can be up to 30% in certain circumstances. And there's a process that you can go through to bring that down, but it's quite involved. So um, I would speak to people that maybe have a little bit of knowledge base that can help you through some of that stuff. Um, I definitely would think that a good travel agent uh, is a big resource. Um, and, and I think as well, if you can find a travel agent on the ground in the territory that you're touring into, can make a big difference. Um, in the past, from previous experience, trying to book some US stuff out of Australia versus working with a travel agent who might have really, really good deals in some markets um, over there made a big difference. So as many people on the ground that you can get that can help, I think, is a good idea. I would also just add to that and say, you know, I would be mindful of the money that you're spending, you know. Um, if, you know, for the, like Courtney Barnett, where CMJ was really successful for her, um, she had everything planned to basically maximize her potential there. And if you're talking about $50,000 to go and do that, I would have said that it was a, like a good bet to, to have gone and done that. But you know, if you have an artist here who has things locally going on, but um, might not have the interest abroad yet, but you're just saying, I just need to get over there because it'll just transfer, it might not make sense to go and just waste that money. You know, I, I almost always advise all of my international clients to wait to come over until every, you have an entire team in place to really maximize the potential that you, that you can get out of the US or Canada or wherever. And um, you know, $50,000 is a lot of money and it can cripple you. And if you could spend those resources developing yourself here where maybe you develop yourself so much that $50,000 doesn't become that much because you're making it here, then you take the chance abroad. Um, there's also other indicators, you know, where if you're getting US blogs that are um, pushing your music and, and you know that you're gonna have an audience there, then it also might make more sense to take a little bit more of a risk without a team because you'll be going there in search of a team which goes back to what he said in saying, you know, talk to people that know what they're doing over there before, before you go. But um, yeah, I would just, I would be cautious and mindful of going over abroad just to go over abroad. Yeah, because even if it will transfer, like you could be playing, if you don't have a fan base or interest already, you could be playing to a room of 10 people and then hooray, that 10 people, you know, translates into it doesn't translate into 50 grand. Yeah. But there's so much that you could do here to kind of maximize your, your own market and even make money here. Um, in order to go over internationally, like doing syncs and doing gigs and building up that money so you can build your record to then eventually get proper people in those countries to then go push your record digitally because we have that digital platform which is connecting these countries to overseas to then gain that interest. Um, and another point that I feel like people, I'm not sure that in Australasia it's done as much, but um, if you know the story of Amanda Palmer and her doing a Kickstarter and asking for money and crowdsourcing, that's a great resource that I feel is fairly untapped here, and I might be wrong in that sense, but you guys could well, tell me um, more. Yeah, I mean, we are um, with hiatus, for instance, when things went gangbusters for them, and that was <clears throat> really uh, mid-October. And I went over just on a networking because there was enough inter interest over there. And we had a tiny little bit of industry that was coming in. And then Nay and I went, okay, it's, we worked it out. It's going to cost us three and a half thousand dollars. That's all the kitty we had. There was a manager we were going to meet in New York. He wanted to meet with us. So we got on the plane. She'd never been out of the country. The day before we fly, Questlove is tweeting about the band. We're getting on the plane. Erica Badu is tweeting about the band. We land in New York. There's 35,000 tweets. And the next day, we're at Jimmy Fallon. The next day, we're in Cara Lewis's office. 
he's like managers, you know, she's the agent for Kanye West and Eminem. That happened really quick and that was just crazy luck. But um, uh, we realized very quickly, she's like, got to be at South by. We're in like close to November now. There's no money in the bank. The government grants don't turn around quickly enough. So we went straight to the fans and we really connected them and really told our story. And yeah, we made $17,000 really quickly. And that was just enough out of, and we gigged the hell out of Melbourne. We saturated the hell out of the market, didn't listen to our booking agent whatsoever. And we took all the money and we threw it all into the bank, went over, did a sold out tour of US. And then went, went around again for the you know, US summer season. But that was that moment where with crowdfunding and a lot of these people, some of them are Americans, but some of them were our friends, our family. You know, and you can only, I feel the one thing about crowdfunding, and I do help a lot of people with campaigns here, you can only do it once. I feel like you really don't overuse it, don't abuse them, and like make them care, and you've got to choose the right moment. Because now, like, I, just, I mean, we can still do with money for all sorts of things, but I think it's a cop-out to fans now, you know, because they, they helped us that time, and now they see that we're signed to a major, and you expect major pays every bill along the way. It's not the truth, you know, but um, you've got to choose your moment for it as well. And they got to, they want, you want to make them see that there's just this gap that's there. You need to help them. That you're on the way. They just need this little bit of help. What, what platform did you use when you used asked? used Indiegogo because the percentage is a little bit higher, but the problem with like a possible, for instance, which most Australians use, is if you don't hit your goal, you don't get your money. But so Indiegogo, people assume it's the same thing. They assume that if you're not going to hit your goal, you're not going to get your money. If you hit your goal with Indiegogo, the percentage, anyway. It's all silly, silly percentages. There's probably stuff. another panel to talk. We also knew the Indiegogo owner. We had a relationship there. He went to preschool with the co-manager in New York. So Indiegogo made it, they made it like, you know, they made a really platform. That's South By, we did a documentary. Yeah, they got behind us. I think, I actually find this really fascinating because as we, we all agree there's a thirst for what's coming out of Australia, but it's about building yourself locally and having those networks there and then there are so many different options of, of getting over there and you've got to pick the way that's, that's right for you. We'll, we'll have a, a number of different genres represented in this room today. Um, but when you do make that step and you make that right decision for you, or you hopefully make the right decision for you, um, even though the, the principles of building a band in every territory in the world might be the same, how much do you rely on the local knowledge, what, what you guys are just talking about there, about building the team? How, how important is having those right people to tell you about those markets? Um. I rely really heavily on people that I trust in terms of tips and finding new music. So um, aligning yourself with the right people I view, if you're a, a smaller artist, is completely essential. Um, you know, there might be some people in Australia that I trust their opinion and I like their taste in music. And if they send me something, I'm going to consider their artist extremely um, a lot and then there's other ones who I don't really like their taste in music and I don't think that they um, help further artists and if they send me something I won't um, I mean I'll give every artist a shot but I generally will pay more attention to people that um, I, I like and, and that's different for everybody but um, you know I do think it's really important in lining yourself with with the right people and um, you know if you if you're talking about Triple R here, you know, I, I try and keep in touch with people at Triple R and Triple J um, to help feed me um, tips on new music. And, um, you know, that might be an important person, a more important person in lining up to come and champion your band and get early than, say, a manager um, who uh, might or might not help your career and might or might not be a great manager and you would be indebted to for three years. Um, you know, so uh, a lot of a lot of key press and tastemaker people. I think it's it's that would be a good early first step without having to overcommit to like a booking agent or a record label or a team locally. Because um, also a lot of times when you align yourself with people like that, you can kind of be pigeonheld into that person's um, genre or what they do well. Uh, even though as an artist you might be a bit different or outside of their circle. I also think like when you're looking for a team you should look at what people that you, artists that you love and strategies that you've seen that you really like. Um, those people, what are they doing? Who are they? Go find out who they are. And I would say probably everybody on this panel, if you were to ask us like, hey, can I just like 
have an informational interview or a Skype with you, we would all say yes, and then you'd be directly aligned with those people. We're all very accessible, I think, in that, in that way. So if you research who you really like and what they're doing, I think it's, it's only an arm's reach away, and those people can then recommend other people for your projects as they listen to them. Yeah, Facebook messages to bands don't work. <laughs> I, I actually, I, a Facebook message lord to get in contact with you on the page, and it just... No one got back to me, so. I'm so but it's, sorry. It's, it's funny, like, <laughs> like they'll give you their life story and like the links and everything, and it's just, yeah. I mean, I still look at it occasionally, but we are actually, like you're saying, like so much of it, if you look into it, is just there. Facebook to media doesn't work either. Yeah, I think one thing that I would definitely say as well: there's a tendency for people to feel like things are a little bit insurmountable or it's very overwhelming, and I think often people can forget how important it is within your own local. Um, community of bands and artists to engage and help one another on that very local basis. I think so many good opportunities come out of that and grow from that, whether it's collaboratively, playing shows together, building national tours and subsequently perhaps doing stuff internationally. I think that there's a tendency for people to be overwhelmed and to forget how important that is and to be in isolation and think, oh God, how do I do this? I think you've got to really also remember that that's a very important component too, for sure. I mean, we're sort of getting a little bit away of talking about international uh, interest in Australia specifically, but I'm going to play like my year 10 debating card now. And if there's a team line to this so far, it's build the relationships, you know. Then when those opportunities come up and there is the thirst, then they, you know, will, will start to come forward for you, you know. As, you know, what Aisha just said here, we're all here now. You've already made the step. You're here at Face the Music. Start building those relationships and start building those teams around you. Um, but I really liked what you were saying, Cy, before about that Hades Coyote um, progression that just went rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled. Does anyone else have any similar stories of like that, how things just happen overnight or just feel like they happen overnight? In case anyone didn't know who that question was angled at. I mean, that's one of those things. I think it's funny because every time now, now we have new emerging artists and stuff, and whenever anyone talks to me now, they go, okay, well, we're ready to be reactive <laughs> to anything that happens. But... Um, I mean, obviously with Lord, that happened very, it, it happened very quickly, but it didn't all at the same time because she was found when she was 12. So yeah. we developed her for five years, four or five years until I didn't personally, that was Scott, but he developed her and her artistry for that amount of time. So there was a lot of time that went in, into it, but once it was released, it just, it just blew up so quickly in a similar story in that sense where, you know, overnight, there we go. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to really answer that question. Like, do I? Like, it's just a story that you never know what's going to happen. I really think it comes down to that. If your music is amazing, like that, that's how it's gonna. That's how it's gonna go. It's gonna cut through all the saturation and get to those people who really like it. And that seems to be what's happening. Like, you know, with lots of emerging artists and even self-managed artists. If you have a really good track and you put it up, all of a sudden you're getting all these emails from label interest, a and R guy, PR, and you don't know what to do with it. And that's kind of, that means you're doing something right. <laughs> Can I tell my Lord story quickly right. off that? Because <clears throat> I, um, was it the Workers Club she played here? Yep. Yeah, so I saw the video and I was like, that's yeah, cool, it's good. And then it's Charlotte the Workers Club, didn't make it. And then um, I had something else on, and then uh, obviously it started playing, it was on rotation here, then it was national radio, I went, oh, this girl's doing okay. And she, all of a sudden, overseas started happening. And then I know, um, you know, Oscar did a little tour and met some of those guys. And then all of a sudden, the next day, they were at the Arias and, sw you know, swooped that very quickly. And then it was like, and I was over in America and starting to hear it. Like, Gautier just came off the turntable. And then finally, and then that was, uh, Royals was on nonstop. And then we flew over for the Grammys. And we were in, like, some really derelict part of L.A. And every single shop vendor, it was like this Royals played a thousand people at once. And I was like, she's going to just win. And it was just, it just realized like it was just ringing so intensely tight. And um, I've, yeah, it was it's so spellbinding to see something that was stayed exactly the same, true to what it was. And then to go all that way through the front cover with Rolling Stone, the whole personality of it, you didn't see it shape, like shift from like what it was because it was so strong. And that was so powerful for like, it was just the same idea that more and more people just got it and then they made it their own. Yeah, I think another element of it, aside from the music, is that what she stands for is very clear, yeah. and people really understood that. So all the elements together just made it. Everybody was on board and rooting for her, and I feel like still is, and I think that's, that's a really great element where it all kind of domino affected together. At risk of this turning into the Lord panel, I'm going to tell a quick Lord story as well. 
first time she came to Australia and she did those tiny little club shows, it was Good God up in Sydney where I'm from and I knew the booking agent and he was like, man, you got to come and see this. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll come down. He's like, can I get a photographer along? Because I was like, they weren't, you were controlling the image quite heavily. I was like, I need some more photos. And I was like, I can't get a photographer in, you know, no way. It's just, you will not physically fit in the room. So I was like, oh, look, she can have my spot and I'll catch her next time. <laughs> <laughs> I can never go see her now because it's never going to be that show at Good God. It's going to be like entertainment centres. But if I'd listened to that relationship, as Marsha was pointing out, someone who is normally on the thing, I would have seen Lorne with about 150 other people, but I didn't. <laughs> Any other Lord stories? I was there in a small club too, it was great. <laughs> Bugger. Um, I, I think, uh, to segue from Lord, um, like the, the imagery was very important and the, the viral nature of that video was very important. A lot of the talk around the digital industry in the last five years has been quite negative um, and it's been a, a bit of a downer, to be honest. Um, but is this sort of an offset to the, the negative? Is this a, a positive in the sense that we can break bands quicker and that people can see Australia, not just individual acts, but as a whole? Is this, is this what we traded off for falling record sales? Well, I, don't, I don't think any of my bands would have a career outside of <clears throat> Melbourne, Sydney, Lid Brisbane if we didn't have YouTube, if we didn't have SoundCloud. Um, hiatus tour of the world, the band knows all the lyrics to all the songs. There's only four songs out, but they'll play an hour and ten minute set because there's YouTube clips of them online that we've done and we've put out and you know, the label kind of knows about it. And, um, but people, you know, we can't, we can't just tour an EP for two years, but we have been. Because I mean, like, there's other songs out there, everyone knows them. Same with, you know, same with Oscar as well. His SoundCloud um, content is, you know, this quite extensive. And um, but you know, as far as like getting a label behind you, putting financing and a proper PR plan, that's positioned towards a very one piece of work. But it's so important to have all this other catalogue that's there because people are hungry. When you become interested in an artist, you need to make sure that I think there's other things for them to go into, interested in. When I became interested in an artist. Like a, like a Dev Hines, for instance, you know, and then I want to be able to know everything else that he's been doing, and then those little one-offs and those B-sides and all that stuff, and it needs to be there now. I want it. Give it to me. I think we need to, yeah, treat, you know, consumers like that. We need to give them the option for it, because when they want it, give it to them. I mean, like, how cool is that, you know? You, you said there that your band, you wouldn't have the career that your bands have without the way the market is at the moment. So this is exciting. These are exciting times for music and music in Australia um, in particular. Um, so I think that anyone that is a bit depressive this week and when you go around chatting to everyone and networking your asses off, just slap them and say, no, this is a really yeah. cool time. <laughs> Which is why this is such a great panel to kick off the uh, conference with. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna throw to uh, to the audience uh, quite soon, because I'm sure you've all got some uh, pertinent questions. Um, but I just wanted to, I guess we've sort of touched on it, um, I think so, a little bit earlier. Is there a point where you stop chasing the international market and the international market starts coming to you? Or is it always a bit of a give and a take sort of situation? Um. Uh, as far as like when a, when a band develops and you stop, you know, knocking the door, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what that point is called, um, but um, it's it comes down to again what we're talking about relationships, having those networks there, you know, once you are, those networks are strong, it doesn't matter where you live, like you know, I mean, it sucks to try and talk to London and New York in the same day, but you get up at seven in the morning and you have that conference call, so those people doesn't matter where they live anymore. Once those networks are there, they're invested in the act. Sucks because we're in Australia and we have to fly them 17 hours to go over there. But everyone, as hopefully, is as invested in it. So, um, uh, no, I forget the question. That's right. It was a good answer. Yeah, I'm tired. I've been up since skyping since six. So, yeah. This this is real life example of what it's like to work with a band that's breaking overseas at the moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, Aisha, your job at the moment just be must just be answering emails saying no. <laughs> You are not wrong, actually. And, then, and actually, it's weird coming from the other side where you say yes to everything you want to do, has, have as much relationships as you want. It's actually harder, in, in my opinion, because I want to say yes to everything. Yeah. But you can't, you kind of have to be strategic about it. It's definitely harder saying no. And it's, it's more of a strategic thing, like you said. I mean, when you say no, uh, you have to think about the implications of saying no, um, which is a spoiled thing to say but um, it's, it's definitely a harder decision. 
Uh, Will, anything to add on that sort of nothing? <laughs> uh, I think you're right. It's, it's harder to say no. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I'm going to throw to the audience very quickly, but um, be prepared. Have good relationships. Then when that opportunity comes, if that is an international opportunity, then you can act on it and you can start to, to build uh, on those things. I think that's sort of what everyone agrees on here. Can I just add one thing? Go the, for it. The other thing that I think people forget down here is that, like, as far as breaking to other, other markets right now, Australasia, like, just being from Australasia is a story in itself. And that really goes a long way. So, you know, don't be like, I'm an Australian band, but you could be like, I'm from Australia, or whatever. And that's enough for them to be like, oh, what's that? What's going on? So. I would agree. And, and also, I was actually talking to a. Um, a Canadian promoter who promotes a festival um, in, in Canada last night, and he um, he runs a festival where 50% of the artists have to be Canadian. And um, and when I pitch him my Canadian bands, he said they're actually at a disadvantage because they're up against every other Canadian artist that um, that is vying for that festival slot. But then when I go and I pitch Courtney Barnett, who is from Australia, it's something unique to him that he gets to go and go to his panel or whomever ends up choosing um, and say, hey, here's an Australian artist that's doing well. And um, Canadian citizens are actually going to be more excited because they get to see an artist that they probably will see once that year. I mean, it, more than likely they won't be back um, to that specific market. Um, more than once, so it's it's a unique thing, and um, to be able to push that, um, even though it does suck that you have to travel 17 hours, it 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 does help internationally to have something that is a bit more unique, um, that is not going to be touring the states all the time, um, and uh, and and you also touched on it. You know, I know the the few basic facts that you had said uh, we all agree on, but. Um, you had said, you know, great music does cut through, and um, that is really what is going to push yourself more than anything, more than any person can do. And um, people in the industry will pay attention to great music and find it and champion it. And if you focus on your music um, first and foremost, and your art, you're sending out your, your best tracks to people that are going to hopefully champion you later on, I think that's way more important than focusing on a team first and foremost. I mean, I, we're all music fans here. Um, that's why we do it. And um, everyone is a fan first and foremost. So um, if you focus on that first, or you have your artist focus on that before sending it um, out, I, I think that's um, really important. I'm just in it for the money. <laughs> Music and journalism, what a great idea that was.